Heavenly Father, as we uh, think about how worthy you are of our praise, as we think about all you've done for us in Christ, in his death, in his, his resurrection, and his promised return, Lord, help us to praise you, not just with our lips, uh, but with our lives. And as we think now about what that means, about what it means to walk with you, what it means to serve you, and to follow you, Lord, give us understanding, help it Help your word to be clear to us this morning. Uh, apply it with power to our hearts through your spirit. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, we're in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 3, uh, verses 8 uh, to 13. Uh, we've been going along in this series in 1 Timothy. So uh, follow along as I read, starting in chapter 3, verse 8. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. So if you were with us last week, uh, we started chapter 3 in 1 Timothy, and, and Scott walked us through uh, the qualifications for elders or overseers in the church. And now as we continue on in chapter 3 and verses 8 to 13, Paul uh, is continuing his discussion on church leadership. Uh, but now he's moving his attention away from those who, who rule over, who oversee the church, to those who serve uh, in the church and with the church. So he's talking here about deacons. And we have to think carefully about this idea of deacons uh, this morning. Because the word deacon is used in lots of different ways and in different kinds of churches. In some places, a deacon is someone who uh, organizes the practical services or ministries of a church. Uh, in other places, deacons function very much like ruling elders in the church. In some places, deacon is a title attached to a person's name. And in other places, people function as deacons uh, without any title or office. And in, in its most basic sense, the word deacon means servant. A person who deacons is a person who serves. And this word is used to describe the actions of Martha when she served Jesus, or even the actions of Jesus himself when he washed his disciples' feet. A deacon is a servant. Anyone who serves is deaconing. But there's also a place in Scripture uh, for the office of deacons, for thinking carefully about how to implement leadership, put people in leadership positions over the service, the practical ministries of the church. And in this passage, Paul lays out the qualifications of such servants. And we'll see that these qualifications apply not only to people who hold the office or title of deacons, but to anyone who serves. Because the character and the conviction of God's servants leads to greater confidence in Christ. The character and the convic conviction of God's servants leads to greater confidence in Christ. So this morning, we're going to organize our thoughts around three headings as we look through this passage. First, we're going to look at the character of God's servants. Secondly, the conviction of God's servants. And then finally, the confidence of God's servants. So character, conviction, confidence. So first, the character of God's servants. In his book, in his book Mere Christianity, uh, C.S. Lewis uses the illustration of, of a fleet of ships uh, to illustrate personal morality. He talks about how as these ships sail in formation, the voyage will only be a success if each ship is seaworthy and has her engines in good order. And in the same way, the ship of Christian service will not sail if the engine of our character is not in order. Because the maintenance of the ship is just as important as where the ship is going. If we are to serve God, then our character is just as important as our actions. And we see this in the first two words of verse 8. It's deacons likewise. 
They make it clear that just as the character of an elder was key to his success in leadership, so too is the character of a deacon key to his success in service. And so Paul, he emphasizes two key aspects of, these character, of this character. Deacons are to be respectable in their conduct, and they are to be responsible for their households. Respectable and responsible. He writes that deacons must be dignified, literally worthy of respect. And respectability is essential for anyone who serves God because service without respectability quickly becomes hypocrisy. All you have to do is watch the news for two minutes and you'll be confronted with a story about someone whose good works were all undone by the revelation of personal immorality. And so Paul wisely highlights the importance of respectability in a servant of God. And he breaks down what this respectability looks like with three negative statements. First he says that a deacon who is dignified will not be double-tongued. They will not talk out of both sides of their mouths. They will not say something to one person and then go and say the opposite to someone else. In short, they will be honest and sincere. They will be the kind of person who, as Billy Graham put it, can give his pet parrot to the town gossip. They will be honest. They will be sincere. And God's servants must also not be addicted to much wine or greedy for dishonest gain. They will be in control of themselves instead of giving up that control to something else, like alcohol or money. They will be self-controlled. And then Paul moves on from these negative statements and writes that these deacons should be tested and allowed to serve only if they prove themselves blameless. But remember here what Scott said last week, that blameless does not mean perfect. He's not saying that these servants have to be 100% completely perfect. But he is prescribing a practice of vetting anyone who could potentially hold a leadership role in the household of God. He is instructing Timothy to, to do his homework to see if there is any reason out there why this person should not be considered worthy of serving in this office. So again, Paul is recognizing the importance of respectability in the life of a deacon. He wants Timothy to do his homework to make sure that these people have the character that should go along with serving in God's church. But not only are deacons supposed to be respectable in their conduct, they are also called to be responsible, particularly to their own family, their own household. Paul writes that their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Now, there's a bit of controversy surrounding this verse. Um, the word that Paul uses here for wives could also be translated as women. And so some commentators and interpreters have taken that to mean that he's actually uh, not writing about the wives of deacons, but about uh, female deacons. Others believe that because verse 11 is sandwiched between statements about male deacons, that contextually uh, he must be talking about the wives of these male deacons. So there's a little bit of different interpretations there. And, and the context in verse 11 leads me personally to kind of personally lead towards probably the, the latter interpretation. I think we have to be careful not to, to get caught up in this or to spend too much time dwelling on this kind of thing with this passage. Because I really think that the emphasis here on this passage is not on who can serve in this office, but on what that service should look like. Because a deacon is a servant. And while uh, some may carry the responsibility of leadership or overseeing um, the service of the church, the qualifications that Paul lays out here, they apply to all people who serve. So anyone who serves, male or female, should be dignified. They should be faithful in all things. And so these character traits, they apply to the deacon and they should be seen in their family as well. If a deacon is married to a believer, there should be a unity in their character and in their conviction when it comes to serving. They should be of one mind when it comes to living out their faith, when it comes to living out the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And so they are called to the same character. And so a deacon should be the husband of one wife. He should be faithful to his wife. He should be a one-woman man. He should manage his children and household responsibly. 
What this means is that the service of a deacon should not end when they cross the threshold of their home. Our family should be the greatest beneficiaries of our service, both as partners in it and as recipients of it. The faithfulness and the responsibility that we have as servants of God, it's not a nine-to-five commitment that you can check out from once you walk into the door. It's an all-of-life assignment. And so Paul, he makes it clear the kind of character that should mark God's servants. They should be respectable. They should be responsible. They should be faithful in all things. Without this character, these good works will turn into hypocrisy. If our engines aren't in good order, then the ship won't sail. But this leaves us in a frustrating position. Because God's servants are called to a high standard of character. But if we're honest, none of us actually meet this standard. We don't possess the perfect honesty or self-control that Paul is calling us to. We aren't as respectable or as responsible as we should be. Our lives are already filled with hypocrisy. So as we look at this passage, it can be easy to see it as a list of things to do, a list of ways to make ourselves better, a list of things to strive for, to try and reach this moral perfection, to reach this character that Paul is prescribing. But if you approach it this way, if you try and achieve all these things on your own, then you're going to fail. Because many of the greatest leadership failures in history came from people who tried to achieve this kind of perfection, this kind of morality, this kind of character on their own. And they either got burnt out or they harbored some secret uh, sin or vice or uh, they just went and, and made a wreck of things. Because they couldn't do enough. They couldn't reach this standard perfectly on their own. And so where does that leave us? Where is our hope? How can we find this kind of character that should accompany our service that we are called to? And the answer is found in the conviction of God's servants. And this is our second point. The character of God's servants. Secondly, the conviction of God's servants. In verse 9, Paul writes that deacons must hold the mystery of the faith with a good conscience. Now this phrase, the mystery of faith, is a phrase that Paul uses throughout many of his letters. And the word mystery here, it carries a a different sense to it than what we normally uh, think of when we hear the word mystery. Usually when we hear this word mystery, we think of a knowledge that is withheld. Something that is uh, secret until someone discovers it. But in the New Testament, the word mystery refers not to knowledge withheld, but to truth revealed. Paul writes in Colossians 1, this is the mystery hidden for ages and generations and now revealed to his saints. To use use an example from comic books, because I'm kind of nerdy like that. Uh, When you hear this phrase, the mystery of faith, don't think of uh, Batman solving a case. Think of Superman revealing the truth about his identity to Lois Lane. See, told you it was kind of nerdy. Uh, but, but I think it's helpful. Because this mystery, it's not secret knowledge that we discover on our own. It's eternal truth that can be made known only through divine revelation. And this mystery, this divine truth has been revealed to us in the Word of God. And it finds its fullest expression in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. The author of Hebrews writes in chapter 1 that long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. The mystery of faith, this divine truth that has been revealed, is that the Son of God, through whom everything was created, who is Uh, the source and the life of all things has perfectly revealed God to us. He took on flesh, he took on humanity to come and make his Father known to us. And the pinnacle of this revelation is found in the death and the resurrection of Christ. Because at the cross of Christ, Jesus, the Son of God, the heir of all things, the one through whom everything was created, 
died. The one who is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, who upholds the universe by the word of his power, who took on weakness and death. And here at the foot of the cross, the truth of God's grace is fully revealed. Because what was Jesus doing on the cross as he suffered and as he died? He was deaconing. He was serving. He suffered and died to serve us. Jesus himself said in Mark 10 that, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus died to pay our ransom. He gave up his life to pay the price for our sins, to bear the punishment that we deserve for all the ways that we have failed to be self-controlled or honest or responsible or respectable. The mystery of faith is that even though we have all failed to be who God created us to be and we have failed to live the way that God has called us to live, God has made a way for us to be made right. He's been working out his saving purposes from before the foundation of the world. And his plan and his purposes are to rescue and to restore anyone who puts their faith in Christ. And so this is the mystery that God's servants must hold to. This is the conviction that motivates our service and transforms our character. It is only when we come to understand how Christ has perfectly served us that we will be empowered to go and truly serve him. It is only when we see how Christ has served and loved us that our service will become not a futile attempt to meet a spiritual standard, but a joyful response to the glorious truth of God's grace revealed in Christ. And so the character that should mark God's servants will only come from a heart that has been convicted and transformed by how Christ has served us. This is why Paul says that deacons are to hold the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. This conviction of what Christ has done for us is not just an intellectual concept uh, that we understand. It is a divine reality that transforms everything about our lives. It enlivens our hearts and enlightens our minds. It it compels our faithfulness and it inspires our fruitfulness. The character that should mark God's servants, it's not something we strive for. It's not something we achieve on our own. It is something that is produced in us as we rest in and as we are transformed by the great servant who gave his life as a ransom for many. And so our character comes from our conviction. And these two together lead to greater confidence in Christ. This is our final point this morning. The the character of God's servants, the uh, conviction of God's servants, and then finally, the confidence of God's servants. And as we've seen as we've been uh, studying this book, 1 Timothy, it's it's actually a letter written by the Apostle Paul uh, to Timothy, who was a, a young pastor leading the church in Ephesus. In a few hundred years after Paul's letter to Timothy, uh, there was another letter that was written uh, to a religious leader with instructions uh, on how to to lead or manage his church. And this letter was written in uh, 362 AD by Emperor Emperor Julian, the last non-Christian ruler of the Roman Empire. In Julian, he was devoted to restoring the, the pagan religion of Rome. He wanted to restore the worship of the Roman gods. And he wrote this letter uh, to Arsatius, the high priest of Galatia. And in this letter, Julian complains that the Hellenistic or the Roman religion does not yet prosper as I desire. And he blames this lack of religious growth on Christianity. Specifically, Julian complains that it is their benevolence to strangers, their care for the graves of the dead, and the pretended holiness of their lives that have done most to increase atheism which Julian ironically used to refer to Christianity. He called it atheism because the Christians didn't worship in a temple. They didn't worship uh, statues. And he says it is their benevolence that have done the most to increase atheism. 
And he goes on to write that the impious Galileans support not only their own poor, but ours as well. And all men see that our people lack aid from us. So in this letter, we find the most powerful man of his day complaining that these Christians, these atheists and Galileans, are outdoing the Roman government and caring for the poor and the needy around them. The servants and the benevolence of these Christians was so powerful that it was turning people away from paganism and towards Christ. And these remarks from Emperor Julian reveal the truth of what Paul wrote in 1 Timothy hundreds of years before. Look at verse 13 where he writes, For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And so as God's servants live out the character that is a result of our faith in Christ, as we serve others in response to how Christ has served us, then the credibility and the validity of our faith will be strengthened, both for those who do the serving and those who receive the service. Our faithful service to others, Paul writes, will result in good standing before them. The good standing here is not meant to to puff ourselves up or to serve as an end in itself. Paul doesn't write that we will have good standing in the public eye because that itself is the goal. Remember, we don't serve to get anything. We serve because what we've already been given in Christ who has perfectly served us. But this good standing before others is important because the more our credibility increases in the community, the more doors will open for the gospel. The more our neighbors and our coworkers and our friends come to see our responsible and respectable service, the more they want to know about the conviction behind our actions. The better our standing in their minds, the more they will take seriously what we believe. And so our service leads to great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. As Paul writes, now, Some of the commentaries that I read were a little divided on this phrase, um, great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Some thought that it meant that good service creates uh, great confidence for those who do the serving, and some thought that this good service creates greater confidence for those who receive the service. And if you ask me uh, which interpretation is right, my answer is yes. Because one of the best ways for you to grow in your faith is to serve. You know, you could spend your whole life reading about boats, but until you actually step onto the deck of a ship, you'll never learn to sail. In the same way, you can spend all this time thinking about your faith, but you won't truly come to know how reliable and how trustworthy Christ is until you step out with him onto the water. In their book, Designed to Lead, Eric Geiger and Kevin Peck describe how Jesus trained his disciples using education through immersion. The disciples grew as they lived life with Jesus and as Jesus sent them out to serve others. Geiger and Peck, they write that Jesus consistently provided experiences to prepare the twelve to develop them into the leaders that would influence and impact the entire world. And so as we step out in faith, as we follow Christ into places we never thought we could go, as we trust in him to do things that we never thought we could do, two things will happen. One, we will come to see how completely and utterly inadequate we are to serve him in any way. But secondly, we'll come to see how trustworthy and how reliable he is to do more than we could ever ask or imagine. Like Peter, Jesus may call us out into the water with him. But if we keep our eyes fixed on Christ, then we will discover to our amazement that we can walk. But not only does uh, serving help us grow in our own faith, it also increases the confidence of others in the good news of Jesus Christ and the reality and the validity and the credibility of the gospel. Because in his grace, God is able to use our faithful servants to help others see the truth about Jesus. This is why the emperor Julian complained about the Christian's benevolence to strangers. It was a thorn in his side because here he was trying to increase the pagan religion of Rome. 
He's trying to restore the worship of the gods. And yet here were Christians serving and caring for those in need. And so the confidence of other people in the gospel, the confidence and the validity of Christianity just grew and grew and grew exponentially because of the service. And not even the most powerful man in the world could do anything to stop it. And the story has repeated itself again and again and again throughout history. Service should mark God's people. It's something we should be known for. It's something that should frustrate those who oppose Christianity because it makes the gospel so much more compelling. Because it shows people how real and how reliable Christ is. And so all believers are called to serve. And there's also a place for thinking carefully about how to put leaders in place to oversee this service. But whether you have a title or not, whether you hold an office or not, all service should be accompanied by godly character that's produced from Christ-centered conviction that inspires confidence in Christ. The challenge before us this morning is to go and be a church that serves others in order to point them to Christ, the great servant, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And if I can, just to speak pastorally here for a second at the end, we have a a huge opportunity to do this now, but also in the coming months as we prepare to plant ourselves in a community, as we prepare to to have a building, as we prepare to have a home. And I think the challenge and the temptation for us during this this season in the life of our church will be to feel like we've arrived, will be to feel comfortable, will be to feel like, okay, now we can check out, now we can come and sit and relax and come and receive. But my challenge for all of us is is to fight against that attitude and to remember that what we are called is not Christian consumption, but Christian service. That's what God has called us to. And so as we we go from here today, but even as we we move into a building this summer, as we think about our neighbors, as we pray for them, as we think about uh, all the different needs in our own church and outside of our church, my prayer for us is to be a church uh, that goes out to serve church that goes out with the character and the conviction that comes from what Christ has done for us, that comes from how he has served us to go and serve others in need. Our prayer is that this church building will not just be a place that we come to, but that it will be an outpost for ministry. That it will be a place we are going out from to go and serve our neighbors, to point them to Christ. And so even if you may not have a title or an office, even if you're not in a leadership position, the challenge this morning is, have you been impacted by the conviction of Jesus Christ who gave his life to serve you? Have you been transformed by that conviction? Has it led to changed character? Has it motivated you to serve others? And is that service leading to greater confidence in Christ, both for yourself and for those You are helping. May God help us by his grace and by his spirit, both individually and as a church, as we pursue all of these things together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're humbled this morning as we remember the the ways that you have served us in Christ. That you sent your son uh, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so, Lord, as we think about our church, as we think about all the different opportunities we have to serve, all the different uh, ways to organize that service, ways to live out that service, Lord, please help us. Help us to have wisdom about how to pursue what's best. Help us to have humility to admit our, our need for you, our inability to serve on our own. Help us trust to trust and rest in Christ, the great servant who alone is able to to save us, and to equip us for ministry by your Spirit. So lead us in these things. Help us to grow in our love for you, our love for others, 
and in our service, Lord. And use us to build your kingdom for your glory and for our good. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.